I have known Sam Carr for a long time. In fact, we met when we were both starting our great adventures in life. And I've had the opportunity to watch his career for five decades. When we, Sam and I, were both young Peace Corps recruits in training, we uh, had a special connection because we were both from the West Coast. We turned out to have some of the same friends and, and hung out in the local pub together. And together we studied bonehead Spanish. What I didn't know then, but certainly know now, is that Sam's lighthearted sense of humor and his playful behavior mask attributes like a patient and persevering focus on long-term goals, a respect for the worth and dignity of every human being and a deep sense of social justice. Sam's to, Sam, in fact, was born and raised here in California. He was the son of Fred, or is the son of Fred Farr, a California senator. He earned his bachelor's degree at Willamette University in Oregon, my home state. When his two years in Peace Corps Colombia, 1964 to 1966, exposed him to the deepest poverty and to profound grief. It was during those two years that he lost his mother to cancer and his sister in an equestrian accident that happened while she was visiting him in Colombia. Those experiences, along with his Peace Corps experience, dedicated his commitment to a life of service. And he remains focused on eradicating justice and addressing the injustices of the world. For a few years after Peace Corps, Sam served in the California Assembly as a staffer until 1975 when he was elected to the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. In um, 1980, five years after that first election, he was elected to the California uh, State Assembly, where he served for 13 years until 1993, when he was elected by the 20th District in California to represent them in the United States Congress. And that is where Sam found a special niche for himself as a loud and passionate advocate for Peace Corps. I must say that we in the Peace Corps community breathe a collective sigh of relief every election when Sam is once again elected by the 20th District of California to represent them. In November in 2014, Sam was elected to his 12th term. He is now in his 23rd year in the U.S. Congress. Samuel Sharon Farr, we are delighted to welcome you to the podium. Once a librarian, always a librarian, all of, all that data. <laughs> Look, yesterday morning I woke up in Washington, D.C., went and spent the entire day on the floor of the House of Representatives and was totally depressed. <laughs> Today I woke up in Berkeley, California, came over here, and I Outside these doors, that the free speech movement began with Mario Savio, yeah. and in that, Peace Corps volunteers were recruiting people to join the Peace Corps. <laughs> he was a voice for "Let's have peace on Earth," and you are the Action Corps that went out and proved that you could actually do peace work. Mm -hmm. And I am so excited to be here because there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of things going on in our country, and Congress 
obviously deals with almost all of them. And I want to talk about that. But first, I want to just follow up on a comment that Pat made, because I think it relates to a lot of us in this room, maybe all of you. I, I went into Peace Corps training in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in Pat's program, which was called Columbia 8. In those days, the Peace Corps had what they thought was a well-found policy called deselection. They would take people who they didn't think could make it overseas and tell them they couldn't go. Not by people that had ever been in those countries, but just by some kind of psychological. And as Pat said, bonehead Spanish. I didn't. I said, I don't, I, I've lived in Latin America for a summer. I can learn the language on the job. And I goofed around in the class. Well, they deselected me. <laughs> so I'm standing here today that shows that deselection doesn't work. <laughs> do in-country training and it's self-selection is the way it should be. So anyway, I did, when, I, when I got home, very depressed, my mother just said, hey, this is the United States of America. He said, why don't you show the Peace Corps you're really interested in learning a language, go to the Modern Institute of International Studies, study Spanish, and appeal, because every bad decision in America can be appealed. <laughs> and I did it. And I got back into another program, and in that program, uh, I met Maureen Orth, and we were and ended up being in the same town, and just uh, families got connected because of our connection in Colombia, and we've been friends ever since. In fact, I just visited her 50th anniversary of the school she built, small little tiny school, which is now a big school, and she has kids in that barrio, in that vereda, in that little rural area that would have never gone to high school. They now have scholarships to go to college. It is. It works. But what really converted me into um, this sort of passion for the war on poverty was when my sister, my mother had died of cancer. I was told that when I was in training. It was like, you know, your mother had an operation. She said she, it wasn't going to be serious. And my dad called me and said it was serious. She didn't want you to worry. And she's going to be okay. In the early 60s, everybody thought, you know, whatever disease you have, we'll cure it. And uh, not telling me that it really was going to be fatal. So I got that notice when I was in country, in Colombia, after about six months. They said, gave me a ticket, my passport, and said, here, you're going home right now. Your mother's on her deathbed. And I got home, and Mom was in the hospital, and I, you know, I had a wonderful two weeks with her. And, uh, and then, actually, she, she came home. And, uh, and I was so for, you know, so glad that she didn't pass away and everything. And she said, you've got to go back. The Peace Corps said, you can't just stay there at home. You've got to either uh, resign uh, or go back. So, and she said, you've got to go back. You signed up for this thing. So excited. I've been so excited by your letters and everything. I went back and my father called me the next day and said, your mother died right after you left. <laughs> and then he said, you know what? I want to come see you in the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. He was in the State Senate, and he came down and visited me in Medellin, and the Colombians took such good care. He fell in love with it. I don't think he wanted to go back to the California State Senate. He said, I've got to bring your sisters here this summer when they're out of school. And my youngest sister was in high school, Nancy, and she came down um, and with Maureen's family and her sisters. So we sort of had our families in different parts of the town, and we knew a Colombian family that invited us to go out to their hacienda to go spend a weekend and go horseback riding. And Nancy was thrown from a horse and hit her head really badly in a really rural area. And the only way to get her to the hospital, because the road was too bumpy, too, too long, uh, was to get her in a lancha in a dugout canoe and take her down the river, ran by the little town of Quito, and uh, I mean of uh, uh, Monteria. And, uh, and uh, they carried her into the hospital. They x-rayed her, and the doctor said, it's good news, she just has a concussion. So she's going to be, just leave her here and come back in the morning. So we came back in the morning and the doctor, all the medical people were standing there and said, uh, it's much more, all of her vital signs are grave and she needs neurosurgery. We have nobody here to do it. We have no equipment. We have, we have, we have nothing. And uh, she can't be moved. So we got on the phone and called the American ambassador in Bogota and uh, my father actually had known them personally as friendships. And the embassy was able to find a neurosurgeon in Bogota. The Navy was able to fly us because uh, Colombian planes couldn't land on a dirt runway at night. But the Navy was exempt from that. 
And if, if the city would, the town would come out and light up the runway, which is they did, they turned on the generator, turned on the radio station, they said everybody come down to the airport with some gasoline to light up the runway, it was a big excitement for that community. And they came and they followed the whole entourage to the hospital. The operation went all right. There were about 250 people doing a prayer vigil outside for these gringos inside. I mean, they didn't know any of us. And unfortunately, when the doctors came out, uh, announced that she wasn't going to make it. That was the worst moment of my life. And, um, and it really bothered me. Came home to the memorial service. And going back, I remember flying into Columbia when sort of seeing the air that we were over land. And I just thought, why am I doing this? Why am I coming back to this damn third world poverty? You know, uh, people just aren't sensitive to needs and they don't have the resources. And there was just this bitterness of it. And then I finally, it was really a, a, a change moment for me because after going through that anger, it's just, well, why did you join the Peace Corps in the first place? Didn't you know the world had situations like this? Mm -hmm. You just never thought it would affect your family. Right. That's the moment I knew that I didn't want any other human being in this world to go through the sorrow and pain that I was going through in losing my sister. And thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work the rest of my life to eliminate the root causes of poverty. And what was so exciting about Peace Corps is it really taught me what that culture of poverty is all about. Nobody understands it. We've had a war on poverty in this country for years. And we still haven't solved it. We haven't finished that war because we never understood what poverty is about. When people have no access to education, they can't learn to read and write. Everything they hear is oral. It's mythology. Their belief system, their vocabulary doesn't have words that are defined. It has words as they get to understand them. You don't have access to health care. That's why you and all, all of our volunteers and those poor audios got knocked on the door, knocked on our door. There, the gringo lives over there. And they open the door and there's somebody there with a dead baby asking for money to bury him. Mm -hmm. They don't have a social welfare system to take care of people who don't have any money, don't have any access. So no, no access to health care, that's sort of what caused, you know, I think perhaps my sister could have survived had there been adequate access. And then I think coming back to America and seeing people sleep on the streets. So I've, I've taken this mission that no one should ever be denied access. Access is both physical location and affordability. As we are in a very expensive, wonderful mm -hmm. state university right here. That's, you know, that affordability really starts blocking people who should be able to get in. And lack of access to a safe place to sleep. Learn from the homeless population that you can't deal with any of your issues personally until you get a place, safe place to sleep because you're just worried about being harassed all the time on the street. So why can't our government just do those simple things, do a universal guarantee of access to education and access to health care and a safe place to sleep? It seems the only time that I've seen that actually is doing that is Cuba. <laughs> but before you uh, take that trip to Cuba, you better eliminate a lot of the members of Congress who yesterday voted to ban any kind of new scheduled airlines going to Cuba to land. Boo! That is done in the House. Oh. Plus, no trade going on. Oh. It's just, it, we're really going backwards. So, <laughs> What, what I think, what, I think what, what, what discourages me in politics is this wonder, the, that wonderful uh, energy we had in the 60s, where we didn't like the policies of our government, we changed them. We changed them through grassroots organization. We stopped the war in Vietnam. I never fully understood what grassroots organization meant until I got into politics and, and got elected in politics. When I realized that every member of the House of Representatives, 435 of us, all have the same conditions of getting there. We all represent the exact same number of people in our districts. And we're all up for re-election every two years. I don't know of any profession in the world that has a contract up for renewal every two years. So what the key point of grassroots organization is members in elective office, in any elective office, they know how they get there. That's their, what they call their constituency. They don't know whether the people they meet are Democrats or Republicans voted for them or not. 
They just know that if you go up to somebody and say, I live in your district, or I'm you know, from one of your towns they live in, you know, oh, that's a possible voter, probably a voter, probably registered. And what they're fearful of is that you're not going to like them. So they pay attention to what you say. And I think what we've fallen about in this country, in, in the new age, I don't know what it is. It's just, I mean, I'm shocked that with 248,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers, we only have 500 here. We have a quarter million people. We probably have a bigger number of returned Peace Corps volunteers than the most effective lobby in Congress, which is the National Rifle Association. <laughs> but they know how to lobby. And we have sort of made it passive, including myself when I got into Congress, because I started looking at the budgets. It took me a while. I wondered, why can't we just increase the Peace Corps budget? There's no opposition. Usually when there's, there's lack of growth or lack of sensitivity, it's because somebody's up there criticizing it. There was no criticism. It's because Peace Corps, in all its years, everybody loves it. And nobody pays attention to how much money it's, it's being given. So I saw this incredible, you know, we want to do supply side economics. The supply side is that 20,000 Americans uh, want to get into the Peace Corps. And every, what, 68 countries or 100 countries that we're in want more. And more countries want us. The demand is huge. The supply is huge. In the middle stands the amount of money that Congress appropriates. And it's very little, $239,000 million. Nothing. After 50 years, it should be easily a billion per year, billion dollars a year. <laughs> Sergeant Schreiber told me one time when we were over at the Peace Corps headquarters before he passed away, he was giving a story about early Peace Corps to all the employees, that President Kennedy had grown up in a um, you know, in a, in a sort of blue blood society and had visited his father when he was an ambassador uh, to England and had been involved in those summer programs in, through the embassy, mostly social programs. And he came away furious at, at how elite the State Department was and how elite, I don't know if USAD was that big in that day, but how elite the Americans abroad were. They were not learning the languages or the cultures. They weren't sensitive to the needs of people in poverty. He came back when he became president and, in, and started the Peace Corps. He told Sergeant Schreiber, I want to recruit 100,000 volunteers. He said, we're going to send them out to all the poverty countries in the world. They're going to get educated there, and then they're going to come back, and they're going to apply for those jobs in the U.S. Uh, State Department and USAID. We're going to do grassroots takeover of our foreign policy through Peace Corps. <laughs> And he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. So it's never been that, that passion to grow the Peace Corps. They, I don't think they ever really understand it. Even the president. I've lobbied every president. And it's, it, oh, yeah, we love the Peace Corps. Well, put more money, because what happens in this process, it's very simple. Here's your politics 101. The president asks in his budget for all these line items, including, and in, this, in what they call the 150 account, it's, it's the State Department and all the nonprofits in there, including Radio Martif, <laughs> and we're just trying to, you know, radio that we're spending a whole bunch of money on to try to convince Cubans that they yeah. shouldn't still believe in their revolution. Uh, it's 50 years of failure. Um, but there's a lot of, there's about, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 different line items in there, including Peace Corps. That's where all our money comes. It's not, you know, that money versus the Defense Department versus HUD or versus anything. It's just that. We're all, they're all in silos. And each one of those silos has an organization like this and people employed who kind of lobby for that. Here's what we did last year. Here's what we want to do this year. And uh, that's about it. So what, what, what moves the needle on any one of those? That's where the passion of politics, that's where legislators come in and say, Mr. President, you haven't asked for enough money. Because normally we don't give them more, particularly in this new conservative climate. In fact, they're cutting everything that the president's asked for. So I told the president when I was, uh, when he was lobbying me, asking me when I was a, a super delegate to the, to, his, to the convention in November in, in Denver, it was, uh, 
He came around and he said, well, you're undecided. I said, yeah. I'm a personal friend of Hillary Clinton's, but I would be very impressed if you could be elected president. He said, well, I need your, your vote. And he said, what will it take? And I said, you've got to triple the size of Peace Corps. <laughs> Sam, I've talked to Harris Wofford, and I'll double it. I said, well, I'm impressed. You've talked to Harris Wofford, you know what you're talking about. I said, okay. Three times in that uh, campaign, and I and became a super delegate, but right at the end, one of those that counted. And um, in his campaign, I, we've, we've picked out three times in that national campaign when he promised to double the size of the Peace Corps. His ask, right after... Uh, President Bush left, uh, was about $15 million more for the Peace Corps. Not a billion, 15 million more. Just more, in fact, um, Congress gave him more money than he asked for. So I've been furious with him ever since. <laughs> and um, I'm reminding him all the time, you know, when are you going to double the size of the Peace Corps? They're, the White House knows it now, because I've been in Congress long enough, and now they need my votes on some things, and they're starting to listen. <laughs> the problem we have now, and he, he came back, and this year he asked for $410 million. Still not enough. I want it easily to be over $500 million. The problem is Congress, when there's proper lobbying, like when President Bush came in and created the Millennium Challenge account, which was a great idea. Let's help. Let's go around the traditional formula funding of foreign aid, and let's go to the poorest countries in the world and work for them, with them from the bottom up and ask them what their felt needs are, and then we'll fund those for just the poorest countries. Great idea. The trouble is that the, the ended up being the embassy telling them what those felt needs, which were, all seemed to be bridges. I did the, I, when I was in, and, and, and roads to ports so you could export, and uh, you know, airports and things like that. I said, no, I think the felt needs always are going to be first water, mm -hmm. and second education, in healthcare and all those things, you know, they want something for their kids, uh, not for their economy, because they don't understand all that yet. So, what did Congress do when Bush asked for this brand new program, untested, unthought of? Give them a billion dollars, a billion dollars. So now we're up there competing against money for the Millennium Challenge Count, which is now ex hasn't proven to be all that it said a bit. So Congress has whacked it down to about eight hundred million. And he never still doubled the size of the Peace Corps and only helping a few <coughs> countries. So what I want to do, I want you to, to take away from today is to really turn yourselves back into that political force that you were when you first joined. In two ways. First of all, let's get a lot more return volunteers involved with the National Peace Corps Association. military veterans to uh, join veterans associations or alumni to join alumni associations, but if we have 248,000 return volunteers, we certainly ought to have at least half of that as members of the association. And secondly, and more importantly, I need you to be that voice to your CARS member. If you don't, if you haven't met or talked to your CARS member, even if you can't stand their guts, <laughs> if you love them, it's too. Well, I love them, and they just think just like I do. Well, still, the voice that you need to do, because squeaky wheels get the grease. That's why you went into the, in the Peace Corps first. Is that squeaky wheel in that third in that country that that, that made some change? I'm from D.C. I don't have one. You don't have a. Yes, you do. You have Eleanor Holmes, or but she can't vote on the floor. The committee. Um, we need to get this voice in Peace Corps. Here's the, here's what I want you to say. You don't have to tell. You know, it should tell them about how it changed your life. But just think of all those people, all that your sons and daughters and grandchildren, that are applying for the Peace Corps now, and can't get in. Only one in four is selected because Congress doesn't put enough money in it. And when they say, well, we can't afford it, we have a tight budget, you say, wait a minute, I thought we had a jobs program in the United States. That was our highest priority, to employ people in this country. Do you happen to know, Mr. and Mrs. Congress member, that the cheapest job in the federal service that anybody <laughs> can <laughs> is a peace corps officer? It's 10 times 
times cheaper to send a volunteer overseas than to send a military uniform overseas. Yeah. Yeah. It's four times cheaper than a USAID report. It is actually the low because you know we don't get any benefit package or anything. So the the the, the cost per person going in the Peace Corps is absolutely the lowest there is in, in the government. And I can't convince the president in his job program mm -hmm. to think about Peace Corps being jobs. Rahm Emanuel was chief of staff and I got in a big fight because the president was doing a stimulus package. And Rahm was then chief of staff for him and he came over to the house and said, you know, we really need this money for the job program. Millions and millions of dollars for the job program. I said, Rahm, let's be practical. You're going to be training all these people for jobs that don't exist. What a disappointment. I said, how about putting that money into the Peace Corps? He said, well, those aren't American jobs. Oh. I said, no, oh, you have to be an American citizen to be in the Peace Corps. Yeah, really. You are American. This is a job by our federal government. Their commute's just a little bit longer than everybody else. <laughs> and still, we don't have it as part of our mantra on we're talking about growing jobs in America. Well, we've got jobs that are already could be filled right now, be filled for all these countries, if we just had a little more money. So your ask to these Congress members, and next year is an election year, is to really, really, I mean, we're going we're gonna, to, what's happening now is the President's asked for $410 million this year the most he's ever asked for. The House Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs, marked this up yesterday, day before yesterday, and they gave us $379 million, the exact amount of money they gave us last year. That's a disaster. This is the first time Congress is marking up less than the President's asked for. And if we go that way, we're going just the opposite of all the things we've been talking about here. That's why I'm really glad that we're associating with non-governmental organizations, NGOs, both international and, national and, and domestic here, because I think we're going to need that kind of collaboration. But we can't continue to be a leader and continue to promise this great dream of experience of living overseas and doing good work if we don't get more money out of Congress. And it's really just it's shameful that our Congress doesn't, it's not, and, and, and what, what, I, what I hear is people say, well, I'll just tell them the story. It's not that. They don't have, it's not where we're comparing one story with another. We're just, the politics is we want more money in that account. You figure it out. You don't have to tell them how to do it. Because whatever the pressure is, we respond. We have to. Because those constituents back home, and it doesn't take a lot. The NRA. <coughs> Uh, I don't know if there's any card-carrying members here, but if they are, I, I'll admit right now, my record with you is an F. <laughs> but the NRA, I think, is the most effective lobby in the United States. They get everything they want, and they don't do it loudly. They're very quietly. Just put a little language here, a little money there, a little language here. Don't allow them to spend money. Do you know this week the NRA got six amendments into the appropriations bill? Oh, Three of them didn't even get challenged for the vote. <laughs> the two that got challenged, that is, let's delete them, got approved by the House. They were the ones to now prohibit uh, ATF from limiting sale of bullet piercing, of, of armor piercing bullets. Hunters need those now because all the game out there is caught on and wearing flat <laughs> <laughs> and to prohibit the uh, ATF from limiting the sales or ordering the sales of silencers. Because when you're hunting for those armored, wearing plated deer or ducks, you don't want to scare your dog. <laughs> this is really scary. And, it's, and they're getting it. There's no news in the paper about it. Nobody's saying anything. But here's how they do it. They're funded by the uh, uh, gun manufacturers, which put a lot of money into their organization. That money hires very capable lobbyists. A capable lobbyist is one that really understands the workings of Congress and understands who sits on what committee and when bills go to that committee, who are the legislators we need to lobby. And then they go out and they are able to recruit among their membership of, of uh, uh, these Second Amendment uh, passionate people, I call them foamers, but um, 
They, they say, will you, if we contact you, will you contact your congressman within 24 hours? Promise you'll do this. And you know, they get a couple of dozen of people who say, I'll do that. And here's what you're going to tell them. You're going to call them, or you're going to email them, or you're going to write them, or you're going to try to visit their office. Those lobbyists know exactly the timing. If we had that in the Peace Corps, we'd know exactly the people that are sitting on that. And you don't have to know all the members of the, con of the House and Senate, only the ones that sit on that subcommittee. Those are the ones that make the decision. Whatever they make here, it'll stay in the bill. So if we were able to you know, pick out those 12 members of that subcommittee, and really lobby them at the appropriate time when they're thinking about this. Now, we sent a letter with more members signing that letter to increase the Peace Corps budget than any other ask in, the, in Congress and then it, that they were dealing with. And they still didn't do it. I mean, so it's not just a bunch of us asking our colleagues, our friends, because what really is going to motivate them, again, looking over their shoulders, who's voting for me? Who cares what I do here in this committee on this particular item? So we got to make, we've got to make our political system watch and listen to us. We are the people. <laughs> we are lent this job in Congress. The whole Washington, D.C. is lent to those who are elected. It's owned by you, the people of America. Let's make that dream of the Peace Corps really fulfilled by allowing everybody who applies and wants to go in, have a place overseas, because there's enough money to put them there. That's your mission. Thank you. Entities and persons that are contributing. 
Uh, unless they're big time, all there, you don't remember. You get kind of get lost in that list. So yeah, packs can be helpful if they're targeted. Um, there's an oceans pack that I've watched that has really helped me on the oceans legislation because they've targeted elections and they've actually taken people out that have been you know, really anti. Um, but I, 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 I think the gra I think the grassroots petitioning your government is the most still the most effective way in our democracy to get the change. And we have for the Tea Party. <laughs> we have a comment from um, NPCA President Glenn Blue. <laughs> thank you. Just to build on what Sam is saying here, thank you so much. Lobbying is so important and you are important in that effort. We can provide you the information that you need, the contacts, and the information about how to present your case. See Jonathan over here, wave your hand, Jonathan, FPCA Advocacy Coordinator, and he will make sure you're online to get everything you need to, to make that possible. Thank you. All right, and thank you. Another round of applause for coming.